Gamacho ba? I'm Robin Pearson from the History of Byzantium podcast. If you like Georgian history, then you're going to have to get used to hearing about the Byzantines. Those Eastern Romans are going to be coming your way repeatedly over the centuries. And if you think they sound boring, think again. The Byzantine story is full of the most amazing dramatic escapades that history has to offer. Visit thehistoryofbyzantium.com to find out more or search for The History of Byzantium on Spotify or any podcast app. Madloba. Gamarjoba, and welcome to the history of Sacarvelo, Georgia. I'm your host, Roberto, and this is episode 13, The Valiant. In this episode, we will be covering the reign of King Parsman II, better known as Parsman the Valiant. Before I continue, this is a reminder to submit questions for the Ask Me Anything we will be having in April. That's two months from now, so get them into me via email, Facebook, or Twitter. When we last left off with the rule of Mirdat I and his successor, Amazas I, things were kind of dicey between Kartli and Armenia, but they came to a nice, peaceful understanding in the end. Sadly, things were not going to get any easier for the descendants at all. We begin this episode at 117 AD. Rome is at the apex of its territorial expansion, and east in Iberia, we're still dealing with some rowdy neighbors, especially the Parthians. One year before, in 116 AD, Amazaps I perished after 10 years on the throne, possibly while on the road with Emperor Trajan to go to battle with the Parthians. In 117 AD, possibly because the news had to arrive in Mitischieta, Amazaps' son, Parsman, took the throne and was styled as Parsman II. He ruled from 117 AD to 132 AD. According to the Chronicles, Parsman II ruled during the Diarchy period in Kartli, but we all know the Diarchy to be somewhat false. However, the story as related in the Chronicles is quite interesting, so I'll retell it anyway. Parsman II married an Armenian princess by the name of Khadana, daughter of the Armenian prince Vologasis I. Parsman's supposed diarchic ruler, Mirdat, married someone from the Persian royal family, and conflicts soon began to brew between them. I just want to mention here that the chroniclers may be falsely attributing some sort of conflict to Parsman and Mirdat, when it could have actually been Parsman I and his own brother Mithridates, but we already covered that in episode 11. Just as the Armenian and Persian branches of the Iberian rulers struggled for power during the reigns of Parsman I and Arshak II, we see the same issue breaking out with Parsman and Mirdat. Another possibility is that there was a rogue Parthian favoring Spaspeto, which means king's deputy, attempting to take Parsman's throne. We just don't know the real story, but the figure of Parsman is still a very big part of the Georgian mythos, so we will retell it as such. By this time, Mirdat was gunning to take the throne for himself, which may have been encouraged by his Persian in-laws. Mirdat knew that to take the throne from Parsman, he had to assassinate him. He decided to first ingratiate himself to the king by inviting him to a grand feast. Very quickly, Things did not go in Mirdat's way. Someone in Parsman's circle tipped him off to Mirdat's plan, and he was noticeably absent from the feast. Parsman very much understood the threat posed by his co-ruler, especially since Mirdat was backed by the Persians. However, just as Mirdat's Persian wife bought him Persian support, Parsman's Armenian wife guaranteed him Armenian support. At this point in the Chronicles, the authors take some time to describe Mirdat and Parsman II to us, which is quite nice of them. Mirdat is described as a vain and bloodthirsty man. That's all they say. Parsman II, on the other hand, is described as a generous, indulgent, handsome, tall, powerful, brave, daring in battle, and as, as fearless as an incorporeal creature, whatever that last thing means. We've got another priest crush. 
The Parsman's the second praise is not stopped there. He is described as having surpassed all the kings of Cartley that had reigned before him. I mean, it's obvious. They called him the Valiant. He was so beloved by the Iberians that even the Iberian soldiers within Mirdat's army were reviled by his bloodthirst and treachery. Not being able to take from such a horrible commander, they joined Parsman's army. Mirdat's influence continued to dwindle and he fled to Persia, leaving Parsman as a sole king of Kartli. I, for one, can't imagine why the winner of this particular conflict is praised so heavily. But anyway, this story isn't over yet. Just before Mirdat fled from Iberia, Parsman employed Aspaspeto, which again is a king's deputy, by the name of Parnavaz. Oh yeah. Parnavaz is back. Parnavaz is described as having just as much valor and strength as Parsman, and they were both equal in power. Parsman considered Parnavaz to be his foster brother thanks to Parnavaz's reliability, loyalty, and devotion. Swoon, what a man. As soon as Mirdat fled from Kartli, Parsman took this chance to place Parnavaz in charge of Shida Kartli in Mirdat's place. He also made Parnavaz Paspeto of the whole country, leaving him as regent whenever Parsman II had to travel. Somewhere, beyond the mountains, deep in Parthia, Mirdat lay in wait, gathering support to regain his lost throne. The Parthian war horn sounded through the mountain passes, and the Parthian army marched into Kartli with Mirdat at its head. Parsman responded to this by calling the Iberian army to his side, along with a force sent by the Armenians. Parsman marched to meet Mirdat at the ravines of Rikinitschevi. Mirdat's army clashed with Parsman's. The fearsome Parthian giants counted among the forces of the former. The battle was intense, but even if the Iberians and their allies struggled in this fight, they had the support of Parnavaz and King Parsman the Valiant. Parnavaz and King Parsman single-handedly felled a great many foes. The battle went on for days, and the Iberians eventually prevailed over their enemies. Parsman II finished the battle by killing 17 Parthian giants, while Parnavaz had killed 23. Despite their loss, the Parthians did not retreat. Instead, they sent out their final champion, a giant Parthian by the name of Jumber, whose greatest feat was fighting a lion with his bare hands. He challenged Parsman II to a duel. For the sake of his honor and the protection of Kartli, Parsman accepted. Then he armed himself and faced his foe. Terrible cries filled the air. Jumber and Parsman II charged towards each other, swords drawn. Iron clashed iron each attack sounding like thunder rumbling across the skies. They struggled for a long time, but Parsman II soon overpowered Jumber and threw him off his horse. Parsman loomed over the giant and killed him. He then looked over to his army and in a booming voice shouted, See? Fierce lions here are like sheep bitten by hail. Whatever that means. Parsman the Valiant's victory shot Iberian morale through the roof, and it destroyed the Parthian army. Mirdat slunk back into the shadows and retreated to Persia. The following year, Mirdat returned with an even bigger army. Parsman gathered his infantry and his horses and camped at Mitasheta, because he could not hope to match Mirdat's army by manpower alone. Mirdat soon arrived at the walls of Mitasheta, and instead of a large set-piece battle, they decided to begin with a series of single combat challenges. Parsman killed 12 Parthian champions, while Parnavaz killed 16. Parsman soon had enough of Mirdat coming into his lands. Past the point of caring about how outnumbered his army was, he set out in the morning. Fortred was on his side, and he, along with the Iberian forces, was able to rout the Parthian camp and kill countless Parthian troops. While they fought bravely, Mirdat once again slipped from his grasp and retreated into Persia. This victory over the Parthians wrote the names of Parnavaz and Parsman II into the annals of history, giving them great fame and prestige. Parsman II then became known as Parsman the Valiant.
He was heralded as the almighty commander of the Iberian and Armenian troops. They continued their fights against the Parthians, and none could withstand their might. Well, that was exciting. But remember, the chronicles aren't always reliable. So now, we're going to shift our focus to what other sources say. First, let's start with how Parsman handled international affairs. It's suggested by Professor Donald Rayfield that since Armenia had become a Roman territory, Parsman II decided to try his luck in his war with the Parthians and break decades of Roman alliance. The main evidence for this theory is that in 129 AD, when Emperor Hadrian was holding court in Cappadocia, Parsman refused to go to Cappadocia and pay homage to the Roman Emperor, which greatly insulted Hadrian. Emperor Hadrian had sent Parsman the Valiant a gift of 50 men, including engineers and an elephant. This was the most valuable gift that Hadrian had sent to any king, symbolizing the respect that he had for Iberia, being an important nation and an ally for the Romans on the eastern border. Reports came in that Parsman II added further insult to injury by sending Hadrian a meager number of gold-embroidered cloaks. The nerve! Hadrian supposedly responded rather angrily by placing them on criminals he had sent to perish in the gladiatorial arena. Seems like an overreaction, but okay. Apparently, Parsman still wasn't finished antagonizing Hadrian. He also supposedly permitted Ascetian hordes through the Dario Pass, letting them go straight from Roman Armenia into Caucasian Albania. This also let the Ascetians head straight into Parthia and raid the Parthians, causing King Volexis II of Parthia to pay the Ascetians quite a heavy ransom. If Parsman the Valiant was really trying his luck with the Parthians, why did he let the Ascetians through to invade them? Other sources and historians have their doubts that Parsman was deliberately antagonizing Hadrian. In fact, this breakdown in the relationship between the Romans and Iberians may or may not have actually happened in the first place. Professor David Brond offers a different explanation. The reason Parsman the Valiant may not have attended the court in Cappadocia may have been more out of political practicality than out of insult. The Parthians, as usual, were dealing with a succession crisis for their throne. This instability would have been Parsman's chief concern at the time, so he probably just didn't have any time to actually go to court. Also, Hadrian was trying to disengage with the East, not control it as much as he could. Iberia was mostly on the best of terms with Rome whenever Rome was actively and successfully at war with Parthia, not when they were hands-off. Since Parthia was weakened on its western front, the Iberians had more of a chance of asserting their own independence in the region instead of remaining vassal states. This leads me to conclude that Iberia was mostly trying to be independent in a time where there was no true war within Caucasia. Things were relatively quiet during Parsman's rule, other than some Ascetian raids and all the battles the Chronicles mention. It was by at least 131 AD that any issues between the Romans and Iberia were almost likely repaired. The legendary public servant, military commander, philosopher, and historian Arian came to visit Iberia, likely as an ambassador for Hadrian. During this time, Arian settled the border disputes between Caucasian Albania and Iberia, which were caused by Iberia's agricultural nature and Albania's pastoral nature, leading to people from both lands crossing back and forth. Arian also completed a tour of Colchis, which we will cover in the next episode, using what we know about his thoughts while he was there. Now, we have quite an interesting funeral stele called the Stele of Serapetus, written in Greek and Armazi that talks about the daughter of Ptiaxis, Serapetus. The inscription tells us more names of the people in Parsman's court at the time, even if it was created in 150 AD. Serapetus's father, Zewa the Younger, was Ptiaxis or Viceroy under Parsman the Valiant, his Parnu was Mirdat, and of course mentions the original Parsman. It's fascinating because the Greek inscription is in the third person, while the Armazi version is in the first person to begin with, but ends in the third person. We will have Ben and Eliza from the Battle Royale French Monarchs podcast reading the Greek and Armazi inscriptions for us. I am Serapit, daughter of Zawath the Younger, Pitax of King Parsman, wife 
of Vihomanga, the victorious and winner of many victories, master of the court of King Mahadrat and the Song of Agrippia, master of the court of King Parsman, victorious over the might which Parnavas could not accomplish. Sarah Pitt was so fine and beautiful that no one was her equal in beauty, and she died in her 21st year. Sarah Paytas, daughter of Zewa the Younger, Pityaxes, wife of Yodmangamnos, son of Publicius Agrippa, Pityaxes, who won many battles as Epitropos of the great king of the Iberians, Passman. She died younger than 21 years, who had inimitable beauty. Now my favorite part about this podcast is coming up, which is the part when I get to confuse everyone. Parsman is recorded to have been present at several events in the years after his death, which naturally presents a problem. We don't really have zombies. Historian Cyril Tumanoff writes that his death occurred in 132 AD, but there are records going all the way to 144 AD that say otherwise. This record, called the Fasci Ostientis, was a record from the port of Ostia, which recounts Parsman the Iberian's arrival from around 141 to maybe 144 AD with his wife and child. The record further states that Parsman went to Rome to pay homage to Emperor Antoninus Pius and while there performed a sacrifice on the capital. Then he went to see a statue of himself on horseback being erected at the Temple of Bellona. Then Parsman performed martial exercises with his son and the Iberian elite while the emperor watched. This trip concluded with Antoninus Pius granting land from the Armenian borderlands to Iberia, showcasing the emperor's power to grant and take away land at will. The main issue with this record is that if we have Parsman the Valiant perish in 132 AD, then this would have occurred during the reign of Parsman III, who would be roughly 7 to 10 years old at this point. So obviously, neither married nor a parent, hopefully. We either have an incorrect dating system or Parsman the Valiant did not, in fact, die in 132 AD. For the sake of the podcast, let's follow the date set by Cyril Tumanoff at 132 AD. Since there are sources, mostly from the Historia Augusta, that incorrectly date events. And this whole episode could have happened as late as 154 AD, meaning Parsman III could have been married with a child. But, as I mentioned, Parsman the Valiant's time is coming to an end, and it is time for us to finish the Chronicle's version of his death. The Parthians, seeing how they continued to lose to the powerful Parsman the Valiant, had to resort to trickery and subterfuge. They could not hope to defeat him in battle, and instead acted like the snakes they are and found a cook. They promised this cook all kinds of rewards, for the sake of a single favor. The favor? To go and secure the patronage of Parsman the Valiant, take a deadly poison with him to the camp, and mix it into Parsman's food, and then make Parsman eat it. The cook completed his task successfully, and while eating, Parsman the Valiant fell out of his chair, dead. The Iberians then fell into deep mourning, and their cries could be heard across Cartley. They echoed through the walls of the cities, those living in the villages and towns beat their heads in sadness. Everyone, from the lowliest beggar on the street to the highest noble, cried. Their mourning turned into happiness when they remembered the courage, valor, beauty, and goodness of Parsman the Valiant. Then they went back to being sad as they remembered the reality of their situation. The king had been killed by the Parthians, and that meant they were coming for Parsman the Valiant's throne. And the throne was taken indeed, for Myrdat returned with a Parthian army and took Kartli. Myrdat returned to his holds in Shida Kartli, and the Parthians took control of Parsman's territory. The Spaspeto, Parnavas, soon fled with Parsman's wife Khadana and Parsman's son, Khadam, to Armenia for safety. To support us, feel free to look us up on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as The History of Sacred Velo, Georgia, on Twitter at History underscore Georgia, on our website at historyofsacredvelo.com, or on our email at thehistoryofsacredvelo, Georgia at gmail.com. 
Sacar de Velo is spelled S-A-Q-A-R-T-V-E-L-O. For more direct support, you can buy us a coffee. The link is in the episode transcription and on our website. Our Amazon wishlist is also available if you'd like to purchase a book for us, a more free option, a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast host goes a long way with getting the word out about the show and helping us reach new people to learn about Georgia. Madlaba dan nachfamdis, and thank you for listening to The History of Sacadvelo, Georgia. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.